Hello Adult Sunday School Leader and welcome to the month of March. It's only five weeks from this Sunday until Easter. It's going to be here before you know it, isn't it? Well, we're starting a new unit for six weeks and it's all the lessons are going to be out of the book of John. We're going to be looking at six people, uh, six different situations of people whose lives were radically changed upon encountering Jesus. We're going to examine Mary Magdalene, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, uh, the man who was born blind, the woman caught in adultery, the cri crippled man at the pool of Bethesda. And this week, we're going to be uh, learning about that Samaritan woman at the well as we start into that new unit called My Encounter with Jesus. This first lesson is entitled, Jesus Met My Greatest Need. The focal passage is out of John chapter 4. And the point of the lesson is that only Jesus can truly satisfy my thirst. Well, if you've been in church for a while and you hear the word Samaritan, probably two main stories come to mind. One out of Luke 10, the story of the Good Samaritan, and then today's text out of John 4 about the Samaritan woman at the well. And this story has many different applications. Uh, now, back on July 7th of 2019, if you keep your notes or old material, uh, the same lesson text pretty much uh, was used to teach the point of sharing your faith. Well, today the focus is that Jesus is the only one who can truly satisfy. Now, just a little, just a little quick background on Samaria or Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. I guess that's probably an understatement. Jews looked at the Samaritans as half-breed Jews. That's because in 722 BC, when Assyria conquered Israel, they, uh, the Assyrians, relocated much of the population, and then they shipped in non-Israelites to intermarry with the with the population that, that remained. And so those kids, those children, that was a result of the of that intermarriage uh, was the result of the Samaritan people. Now the Samaritans continued to worship like the Jews, but they only took the first five books, the, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, as their spiritual authority. And they built their own temple out at uh, Mount Gerizim. And we'll look here on the map here, and you'll see that, that Mount Gerizim is, is located there on that, where that brown triangle is, just west of uh, Shechem, which is also called Sychar. Now, in 129 BC, that temple was destroyed by the order of the Jewish king. So, see a lot of animosity going on here between these two peoples. Now, a good Jew, um, when they would go from Judea to Galilee, or vice versa, uh, let's look at the map here, and I'll show you the alternate path that they would take. They would, let's say they're going from Judea in the south to uh, Galilee in the north. They would uh, go as far up as they could in Judea. Then they would cross over the Jordan River, go up, and then cross back over to, to go into Galilee. They would avoid just even passing through Samaria completely. Now, putting that on a larger scale... Uh, a much larger scale. Let's say I'm going from Arkansas to Iowa, and I hated Missouri. And so I would uh, cross over the Mississippi River. I'd go up through uh, Mississippi and Tennessee, a little bit of Kentucky and Illinois, and then finally cross over into Iowa. I'd, Iowa. I would go all that way, out of my way, because I hated Missouri. And that's what the Jews, how they felt about Samaria. So you can see bad race relations. That's nothing new. This has existed for a long time. So we can see just in the first few chapters of John's Gospel that Jesus and the disciples did a lot of traveling back and forth between Galilee and Judea. In the first part of chapter 2, we see Jesus' Jesus's first miracle, which is that uh, changing water into wine at the wedding in Cana, uh, which is in Galilee. That's up in the north. Uh, Jesus and his disciples are um, after that, then they're uh, located down in Judea. And then the last half of chapter 2, Jesus is in Jerusalem, clearing the temple, uh, the temple courts there at Passover. And then in chapter 3, Jesus' encounter with, with, with Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night. In fact, he was the original Nick at night. Okay, uh, and, and this all took place in Judea, back in the south. And then in chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples left Judea, and they're going to go back to Galilee. Now, remember that typical route that they would take. You know, they'd go over the river and up and over. But this time, they weren't going to do that. Jesus didn't take that route. In fact, it says in chapter 4, verse 4 of John, now he had to go through Samaria. And I, I really like how the King James 
version puts it, he must needs go through Samaria. So they made it to Sychar, also known as Shechem. And you can see that on this map, it's circled there in yellow on that map. And Jesus went and he sat down by Jacob's well. It's about a mile and a half west of the, the town of Sychar at that time. And he got there about noon. Well, that leads us to our first set of verses. Eight verses, that's a lot for one, one grouping of verses. In John chapter 4, verses 7 through 14. This woman approaches the well at noon in the heat of the day. And, and a couple of odd, there's a couple of odd things about this. Most women came to the well in the cool of the day, in the cool of the early morning. Also, there were, there were a couple of wells closer, really closer to the town. We're going to discover why she did this, came by herself at this late hour here in just a few minutes. Jesus asked her to give him a drink. And then this interesting parenthetical statement is made here that it, one might question, why is this even here? And the statement is, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. Well, that indicates that Jesus is at this well alone with this woman. Okay, so right there, that's a cultural no-no. Now, after Jesus asked for a drink, she replied, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? And then there's another parenthetical statement here, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Well, this statement means much more than that these two types of people don't hang out with each other. That word associate literally means to share the use of. You see, many of the Jewish ceremonial laws not only described certain people as ceremonially unclean, like the Samaritans would be, but also anything they touched which would include that bucket or that dipper, whatever she had to, to draw water. And we'll, we'll see in a couple of verses down that Jesus didn't, didn't have a bucket of his own to get water, so he was asking to use her utensils, and he would drink from that. That was unheard of. Well, Jesus answers her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you some living water. In other words, woman, if you knew who was speaking to you, what he has to offer, you'd ask him for a drink. Now, physically speaking, living water was another term for a spring-fed uh, water that, that was living, that is, that was moving, it was fresh, as opposed to a cistern that, that held rainwater and could get stale. Of course, Jesus was speaking on a, on a higher, on a spiritual level that the woman didn't understand yet. Okay? She understood Jesus to mean physical water. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, the prophet wrote, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Here in Jeremiah, God called himself living water. Now, perhaps a Jewish person would have understood Jesus' veiled statement comparing God to living water. But the Samaritan woman, whose people rejected those writings of the prophets, she didn't understand this, okay? So she countered back, you don't even have a bucket. And this is a deep well. How, how can you give me water? Also, we've been using this well since Jacob dug it. And that was over 1,700 years ago. Well, Jesus then came back with, you drink this water and you'll come back again, uh, just like you are today, because physical thirst is never forever quenched. But the water that I have, this living water that I have, will totally slake your spiritual thirst because it, it'll constantly bubble up within you and grant you eternal life. We get on down to verses 15 through 18. And here the woman hasn't caught on to the fact yet that Jesus was speaking figuratively, speaking about spiritual things. So she says, give me some of this water so I don't have to keep coming back here. And that could be, of course, for a couple of reasons. One, just for the practicality if she didn't have to go to the well every day, as well as she didn't have to go in the heat of the day. She didn't have to worry about other people uh, seeing her and uh, maybe even talking about her. So Jesus got, first, Jesus got her to recognize her physical need for water, which, of course, was obvious. And then he turned that conversation into her recognizing her spiritual need. And so he said, go get your husband. Now here Jesus is, is getting ready to prove that he is greater than Jacob. Remember, she said, uh, who, who do you think you are? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He's getting ready to prove that he is. The woman admits, hey, I don't, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus says, that's true. You don't. You, you've had five husbands. 
and now you're married or you're, you're not married to the guy that you're living with. Now the woman is is of dubious character here, and Jesus knows she's been married five times. Now, you know we we, we get down on her. Uh, we, you know we, we talk about her character. Now here's the thing: those five different husbands could have been from a death or f from five different deaths, right? Or it could have been from a husband's will to divorce her. Remember, a woman couldn't initiate a divorce. It wasn't like today where, you know, a woman can just file for divorce for no reason and go through husbands left and right. It wasn't like that at all. We tend to characterize this woman as basically a prostitute, but but she really had no say-so in the divorce matters. And granted, she, she could have been like Gomer, <laughs> like Gomer was to Hosea and constantly cheated on her husband and the husbands kept filing for divorce because of adultery. But we don't know that for sure. But here's what we do know. She's now living with somebody. She's living with a guy who's not her husband. So, so there is at least a little bit, if not a whole lot, of um, dubious characteristics with this lady. So this is why many think that she went to the well at noon. Most women, like I said uh, earlier, they came um, in, in the early, the cool of the day. And she perhaps was, would be saving herself from, from seeing those catty glances that coming at her or hearing those little hush whispers and pointing about, you know, pointing to her. Now in verses 19 through 24, which are not in her lesson, the woman admits, Jesus, uh, or whoever you are, yeah, yeah, you're probably a prophet here. And, but she brings up some more contention between the Samaritans and the Jews, and that's the place of worship. Of course, that's, that's a big place, a big area of contention because they had that temple and the Jews destroyed it. And then a little more conversation takes place, and then that leads us to the last two verses for the week. Very short verses here, uh, John 4, 25 and 26. And Jesus tells the woman that he indeed is the Messiah or the Christ that both the Jews and the Samaritans were looking for. Now we see later in the chapter that this woman went and told about her life-changing encounter with Jesus and, and many in the area also became believers. And upon the insistence of the Samaritan people, Jesus stayed there an extra two days. Again, unheard of. Here's the thing, encountering Jesus will change your life. Now think back to the previous chapter when Nicodemus met Jesus. There's some vast differences between that story and this story. Even They're similar, but they're different. Chapter 3, Nicodemus, he was a Jewish leader and a man. He came by night to see Jesus, and Nicodemus initiated the conversation. We get to chapter 4, the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, not a Jewish man. She came in the, or They met in the middle of the day, not at night, and Jesus initiated the conversation, not her. See, I think all this, just in these two chapters, shows that the mission of Jesus was to bring people of all backgrounds into the kingdom. From the, the Jewish guy who is a Pharisee, to this woman of questionable character who wasn't even a full-blooded Jew. She was a Samaritan, despised. Uh, and so you got to the highest of society to the lowest of society, just in these two stories. So... And in both of these stories, there's also this same pattern where Jesus makes a figurative statement about something like being born again. And Nicodemus says, how can I enter my mother's womb a second time? And then over here in chapter 4, about living water. And these statements are misunderstood as being literal statements. The listener, whether that's um, uh, the, the woman at the well or Nicodemus, they think it's, a, it's physical. And then Jesus restates it more vividly. It's still misunderstood. And then Jesus further explains and even more interesting, at least to me, is, is the same thing happened with his disciples. You look down in chapter 4, verses 31 through 38, and he says, I have food you know nothing about. My food, and of course they're thinking, does he have a stash somewhere he didn't tell us about? And it's like, no, my food is to do the will of the Father. Well, this unit is entitled, My Encounter with Jesus. And I think these six weeks are an excellent time to line up people in your class maybe from another class, maybe one of your staff members, to come in and tell how they came to Jesus. So perhaps you can ask some people in your class to share their faith story in, in two to three minutes. Now, you know, and, and unless you really want to, you know, you don't need a 20-minute testimony in your class. Just see if they can briefly do that two to three minutes. And, and you need to ask them ahead of time, right? You don't need to put them on the spot in class because some people really don't like that. They like some time to prepare. I already have a couple of people lined up for the next two weeks, 
And uh, I know, I know most of you who watch this, you do so on late Saturday night or early Sunday morning to get that last minute idea. And, and that's cool. You know, whatever helps, that's great. Uh, so for this Sunday, you might want to just share your personal faith story. Well, next week, we're going to be in John chapter 5, looking at uh, the man who is an invalid for 38 years. It's a great story. It's going to be a, actually a great uh, unit that's going to be leading up to Easter and then also uh, concluding the week after Easter. So thanks again, guys, so much for watching. I do appreciate you. Appreciate your comments you send me occasionally. Uh, don't forget, pray for and with your class. Thanks. Thanks.